Let's discuss the representation of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and conjugation of complex numbers geometrically on the complex plane. Learn to translate the operations into geometrical figures. So let's look at complex number addition and subtraction first. Suppose we have two complex numbers, z1, that is 3 plus 2i, real parts 3, imaginary parts 2i. And we have a point z2 that has a real component of negative 2 and an imaginary component of 4i, and we wanted to add them. And of course, the way we do this is by adding the real parts together and adding the complex parts together. And the real parts are 3 plus negative 2, and the imaginary parts is 2i plus 4i, which equals 1 plus 6i. And we can look at that graphically by looking at the vectors that are formed by z1 and z2. The blue vector represents a vector from the origin to point z1, and the purple vector represents a vector from the origin to point z2. And with vector addition, of course, we put things head to toe. So if we took that z2 vector and translated it up to the, and began it at the end of the z1 vector, so we put the vectors head to toe, head to toe. So our solution graphically to z1 plus z2 is equal to z3, which is 1 for a real part and 6i for an imaginary part. So graphically, complex numbers can be added as well using the vectors that are formed by the numbers in the origin and placing them end to end. A similar thing happens when we subtract complex numbers. If we wanted to find z1 minus z2, we would subtract their real and imaginary components. So z1 minus z2 is equal to 3 minus negative 2 plus 2i minus 4i, which is equal to 5 minus 2i. We can also solve this graphically using vectors. If we take the positive z1 vector, which goes from the origin to point z1, and we take the z2 vector, but instead of going from the origin to z2, we're going to flip it around and make it go from z2 to the origin. That way it becomes the negative z2 vector. So now we have z1 and negative z2, and if we put them in our head to toe, we will find the result of z1 minus z2. So we go from the origin to z1, and then we're going to translate this z2, this negative z2 vector over to the end of z1. So if we take that negative z2 vector and put it at the end of z1, we wind up with the new point z4 that's equal to z1 minus z2, which is the coordinate of 5 for the real part and negative 2i for the imaginary part, which perfectly corresponds to what we get by analytically finding the solution. So if we have a complex number in the rectangular plane and we want to multiply it against another complex number and show that geometrically, it's really best to turn those numbers into polar coordinates because it's actually far easier to work with them uh, in polar coordinates geometrically. So this is a, let's consider this rectangular coordinates uh, 1.73 real plus 1i and that's our point, A. And we want to convert that into polar coordinates. Well, you'll recall that the horizontal part is equal to the radius times the cosine of the angle, and the vertical part, the vertical component, the imaginary component, is equal to the radius times the sine of the angle. So, as you'll recall, any rectangular can be written as Radius times the cosine of the angle, that's the real part. Radius times I sine angle, that's the imaginary part. The real part is 1.73, and imagined part is 1. And we use the Pythagorean theorem, we're going to get 1.73 squared plus 1 squared equals R squared. And so R is going to wind up being 2. So the hypotenuse of that triangle becomes the distance between what winds up being the pole and the point, which is 1 squared plus 1.73 squared, take the square root, you get 2. And again, that is 1.73 is approximately the square root of 3. So in polar form, this is a radius of 2, so its radial coordinate is 2, and its angular coordinate is 30 degrees because do the inverse sine of 1 over 2 and get 30 degrees.
to find that angle. Or you could recall properties of 30, 60, 90 triangles in this special case. So if we transition to a polar system, and you'll call it a polar system, everything radiates out from a pole, and every circle, every unit is one extra length of radius. So this has a radius two, so it's two unit circles out from the pole, and it has an angle of 30 degrees, so it's rotated 30 degrees from the horizontal axis. So in polar coordinates, this is uh, two comma 30 degrees. Well, suppose we wanted to multiply this point A to 30 degrees times a point B, 345 degrees. Now, in the rectangular plane, using rectangular coordinates, we have to distribute. So in the Cartesian system, we take, these are the point, these are the coordinates of the points in the rectangular Cartesian system. We take 1.73 plus 1i and multiply it by 2.12 plus 2.12i, and we would distribute all the parts and get our answer. Takes a little while, but it's doable. Turns out that in the polar system, it's far easier. So it turns out to multiply A times B, all we have to do is multiply the radii and add the angles. So I'm going to go ahead and put these numbers back in their polar form because it's really easy. So again, A times B is just 2 times 3, radial coordinate, and then 30 plus 45 for the angular coordinate. So A times B, where A and B are complex numbers in polar form, is just equal to the radius of A times the radius of B, the radial coordinate, and then alpha plus beta, where alpha and beta are the two angular coordinates, respectively, of the two points. So for our example, the answer would be 2 times 3 for the radial coordinate and 30 plus 45 degrees for the angular coordinate. And you could do this in radians as well. So the answer would be 6, 75 degrees. So graphically, this is kind of what it looks like. If we have a point A that's 2, 30 degrees and a point B that's 3, 45 degrees, and we multiply them, A times B, we're going to get the product of the two radii, which is 6. So we go 6 rings out at an angle of 30 plus 45 degrees, or 75 degrees. So that's a pretty bold claim. Let's prove it, OK? Let's take any number complex number A, real component, and an imaginary component, and a, a number B that has similar properties with an angle of beta. So any two points AB, A and B, and we want to multiply them. So we would say A times B is equal to A, this first part here, times B. And we're going to go ahead and distribute all these parts out. When we do that, we get, we'll put the R1 and R2 together, R1 times R2, and then we distribute this cosine alpha term to both parts. We get this cosine alpha, cosine beta, plus I cosine alpha, sine beta. That's this whole first grouping comes from distributing the cosine of alpha over here. Then if we distribute the I sine alpha to both parts, we get I sine alpha cosine beta, plus I sine alpha times I sine beta, or I squared sine alpha sine beta. And some interesting things start to happen. You remember from the beginnings of complex numbers that I squared is equal to negative 1. These, if we take these terms, and so we remember that I squared is equal to negative 1 from the beginnings of complex numbers, that leads us with this. And an interesting thing happens. We, if we group this first and last terms together and then these middle terms together to kind of group the real and imaginary parts together, here's what happens. What we get is R1 times R2 times this grouping, which actually is the cosine of alpha plus beta, if you recall from trigonometry. Cosine of alpha cosine beta minus sine of alpha sine beta is actually the cosine of alpha plus beta. And then over here in the imaginary part, we get what winds up being the sine of alpha plus beta. Because the sine of alpha cosine beta plus the cosine alpha sine beta is equal to the sine of alpha plus beta. So a little bit of grouping the real and imaginary parts together leads us to this idea that A times B is R1 times R2 times the cosine of alpha plus beta plus I sine alpha plus beta. So truly all we have to do to find the radial part is multiply the radii, and then the angular part is simply add the, adding the angles. And so that's where this comes from.
So we've taken a look at complex numbers in both rectangular and polar planes and how they can be represented geometrically through addition, subtraction, and multiplication.